So it's my um, pleasure to be asked to invite and to uh, introduce today's speaker. I'm David Bennett from the History Department. Uh, Eric Licklau is um, no stranger to our campus. For many years, his father, Myron Licklau, was a, a professor of German literature, a distinguished member of the Department of uh, languages, literature, and linguistics here. And that department is one of the sponsors of our program tonight, uh, along with the Department of History at Maxwell, uh, the uh, Institute for uh, National Security and Counterterrorism, um, the Holocaust and Gender Studies Center in the School of Education, and of course, Eric will be speaking with the uh, the uh, Jewish Federation uh, later today in, in the evening. We've got a lot of sponsors. <laughs> Eric uh, is, of course, a native of Syracuse and uh, um, a graduate of James Lewitt High School, where one of his classmates was my son, Matt, and they've been friends in Washington for many years. And from JD, uh, Eric went, to, went on to Cornell University, and after his graduation from Cornell, he has shaped a career as one of America's truly prominent journalists. He was for 15 years on the staff of the Los Angeles Times, where he did uh, a lot of investigative reporting work. I think his last three years were in the LA Times Washington Bureau uh, covering the Justice Department. And it was from there, of course, he moved on to the New York Times. Many of you know that Eric won the with his colleague, James Rison, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 2006 for his work on warrantless wiretapping in the Bush administration. That was a very big story and had a very important impact in American politics. And Eric took that study and turned it in later into a book. And some of you may have been here when he came up to Syracuse to discuss his work, Bush's Law, The Remaking of American Justice. Since that time, Eric's been covering a lot of other interesting stories in his investigative reporting work, including the NSA and uh, the Snowden uh, matter, WikiLeaks, and I think he told me he's now working on an equally interesting matter, money on American politics. But he took several months off to uh, serve as a fellow at the Mandel Center of the uh, United States Holocaust Museum to do the research for the book he's going to talk about today, The Nazis Next Door, How America Became a Safe Haven for Hitler's Men. I teach American, modern American history and modern military history, including World War II, and I know this book was fascinating for me, but it is a book of very wide interest for large numbers of people, and that's one of the reasons why it's in multiple print printings already. So many of us are anxious to hear what the author has to say. It's my pleasure to introduce, and welcome back to campus, Eric Lickwell. Well, thank you very much, David, uh, and thanks to Alan and the other uh, sponsors for having me here today. It's always nice to be back in Syracuse. Uh, it hasn't gotten any warmer since last time I was here. Um, and I went digging through some old boxes. My wife thinks I'm crazy for keeping some of this stuff for years and years, but when I knew I was going to be back here, I wanted to see if I could find my first byline in any newspaper, which was in the Jewish Observer in Syracuse in 1982. I won an essay contest. That's me. I'm actually like 16, although I look about 11 because I was so, so tiny then. And I won an essay contest. I had my first byline in any newspaper uh, in the, in the uh, Jewish Observer. Um, and uh, uh, still remember that one. I've forgotten the 3,000 since then, but this one I remember. So um, it's great to be here uh, talking about uh, my book, which came out uh, about four months ago now, The Nazis Next Door, How America Became a Safe Haven for Hitler's Men. Um, this is sort of a diversion for me. As, as David mentioned, my, uh, my last book was on the war on terrorism and the, the Bush administration called Bush's Law. This is obviously more, more historical in nature, and it's a bit of, um, a, a, bit of a stretch. I, I usually write in Washington about uh, corrupt politicians, not about Nazis, although some people in Washington would say there's a, a fine line between the two. Uh, and so th this came about almost by accident. I, uh, about four years ago, got a tip from a source of mine who I knew from my days covering the Justice Department. Uh, 
And he told me that there, he had heard about a secret internal history at the Justice Department of the country's relationship with Nazis over the years and the efforts beginning in the 1980s to track down and identify Nazis in the United States. There was this internal history um, that for reasons no one could really explain, the government had been sitting on for years and refused to put this out publicly. There was this exhaustive history of six, 700 pages. The source hadn't actually seen it, but he said that this sounded like something, uh, su such retail, rich detail about this unknown period in US history, it would make a great story if I could get my hands on it. Um, now, in Washington, there's probably no better way to get a reporter's interest than by telling him that the government is sitting on a secret history uh, into, into the Nazis. It's sort of like waving a, a slab of red meat in front of a hungry dog and telling him to get it. And so I was determined to try and get a hold of this report and, and eventually um, was able to get this. And, and we wrote a story about it on, on the front page of the New York Times looking at um, this study seven years in the making. It was sort of the Pentagon Papers for Nazis. Um, and examining both how hundreds and hundreds of Nazis have been able to get into the war after the year, uh, after the war, and also how the government, the Justice Department in particular, had belatedly in the 1980s tried to identify them and deport them from the country. Uh, it also had these fascinating little glimpses of the relationship that the CIA and other intelligence agencies had with a number of these Nazis. And it was the kind of story that even before it was published in the paper, I, I knew that there was a book there. Um, it, was, it was more than you could, could really do justice in, in 2,000 words in a newspaper story. And it was this, this really shameful saga in US history that most people knew nothing about. Um, by, by my tally, there were probably as many as 10,000 Nazis and Nazi collaborators who came into the United States after the war. It's a staggering number. Um, and the country was essentially blind to this until the late 1970s. Um, when people like Elizabeth Holtzman in Congress and others began waking up to the fact that you had um, Nazis, some of them top high-level Nazis, who had basically made new lives for themselves inside the United States. And so I, I thought that this, there were so many interesting and, and, and disturbing questions. How had they gotten in the first place? What was the relationship with the US government in some of these cases? Um, what did the government know about their past roles and atrocities? How, how, how was it that we had turned a blind eye to this for so long? That I wanted to, um, I wanted to look at this in, in book length form, if you will. And uh, so I began my research and decided to examine, in, oops, excuse me, in really minute detail, a couple of um, particular Nazis who made their way into the United States. So I sort of tracked their lives uh, of three or four guys, um, a local politician in New Jersey, uh, a businessman in New York City, an encyclopedia salesman in Massachusetts, who secretly had been involved, sometimes at very high levels, in Nazi atrocities, and had managed to put all this behind them. And so um, sort of my reporting mission as I started this was to understand sort of everything about the lives of these handful of ex-Nazis uh, and how they had made their way into the United States. Um, but the, the overarching story beyond, beyond tracing the lives of these individuals uh, was really about the post-war period and the Cold War and how the, uh, the, new, the new battle against the Soviets after World War II really allowed this to happen. Um, now, what do I mean by this? I mean, the Nazis is obviously a World, War II, a World War II story, not a Cold War story. But what I mean is that the Cold War really infected and corrupted every aspect of our relationship with the Nazis after the war. Um, the Cold War was the reason that the United States brought in some 1,600 scientists to the United States, engineers, doctors, uh, technicians, and others under a secret program that was known as Project Paperclip because we wanted to get our hands on those scientists before the Soviets could. We wanted to exploit their technology um, for use in uh, not only building bombs, but taking, man, taking the United States to the moon ahead of the Soviets. We knew full well at the time that they had been involved in horrific human experiments um, and slave labor camps for the Nazis, these, many of these scientists. But that was essentially uh, papered over when we brought them here. So the Cold War was, in that case, the driving and all-encompassing factor in bringing those 1,600 scientists. The Cold War was also the driving factor in using hundreds and hundreds of ex-Nazis as, um, as spies and intelligence assets, uh, as many as 1,000 around the world. And I think that's probably the one area where, where this book hopefully broke, breaks the newest ground is, uh, is in examining 
the, these really subversive relationships that the CIA, the FBI, OSS, and other agencies had after the war uh, with top Nazis and Nazi collaborators. There were as many as a thousand around the world um, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, ex-Nazis who were hired, who were on the US payroll uh, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Latin America, and right here in the United States. And the feeling there was, again, that the Cold War required us to uh, exploit the supposed intelligence value of these hundreds of ex-Nazis. The thinking was that no one hated the Soviets more than the Nazis did. They had been fighting them for years. They knew them better than we did. As we turned after the war in the late 1940s and 1950s to the Soviets as this huge new existential threat, the feeling was that the Nazis could help us fight this battle. Now, the morality aside, this turned out to be a very short-sighted view. Many of the Nazis that we hired turned out to be bumblers or con men or, in a few cases, even Soviet double agents. Uh, but the necessity in the minds of top intelligence officials was that their, their past sins be damned. We needed these people in the new Cold War. The Cold War was also the driving force behind thousands and thousands of sort of rank and file Nazis getting into the country. Not necessarily with the knowledge of the US government the way the scientists did or the way the spies did, but really with sort of a blind indifference to the fact that, that they were coming into the country. Um, after the war, the, the new Cold War policies um, opened up the floodgates of immigrants from Eastern Europe, from the so-called captive nation states that had just been occupied by, by Hitler in, in Eastern Europe, in Estonia and Latvia and, and Lithuania and elsewhere, and were about to be taken over by the Soviet Union. We wanted to get as many of those people out of that, re that region um, as we could, especially the, the staunch anti-communist ones, because we were in this new global war against the Soviets. So these were people who were seen as, um, uh, as, as future Americans who uh, were better, better positioned in the United States than at home in, in their uh, occupied lands against the Soviets. Now there were something like 400,000 um, immigrants who came to the United States after the war from that region of Eastern Europe, from, from the uh, Baltics and, and elsewhere. Um, and no doubt many of them were in fact legitimate war refugees, but it's also now clear that there were thousands of people uh, from that region who were top Nazi collaborators who, because of these loose immigration policies, managed to sneak into the country with very little difficulty. It was easy to say that you were a farmer during the war, or uh, a POW, or a civilian, um, and hide the fact that you were, for instance, one guy from Estonia was the head of a Nazi concentration camp. He was the guy that would meet the busloads of children in a place called Tartu and would lead the children to the edge of this pit where they were machine gunned to death. And he would save the dolls and the clothing and put them in a pile afterwards. He lived in Long Island for years and years. It was very easy for him to disguise himself as an Eastern European immigre under these Cold War immigration policies. So the Cold War affected not only the ability of thousands of people to get into the United States despite their Nazi ties, but it also affected how we did and didn't go after them years and years later. Uh, in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, when the United States finally started looking to see, hey, are there really hundreds or maybe even thousands of Nazis in our midst, there was a real backlash from Cold Warriors, from people like Pat Buchanan, uh, in the Reagan White House, who believed that this was all communist propaganda. If you accuse someone of being a, a Nazi in the United States, the real reason, they believed, was that you were usually a staunch anti-communist, and, and this was bogus propaganda that was being promoted by the Russians. Uh, and this, this backlash had a real effect in, in slowing, and in some cases, out and out obstructing investigations in the 1970s and 1980s into um, into suspected Nazis, many of whom were not just suspected, but were in fact legitimate high-ranking Nazis who had lived in the United States. Um, and then the, the final um, phase of the, the, the Cold War's effect on the Nazis of the United States came in the eight, 1980s and uh, early 1990s with the, the thawing of the relationship with the Soviets, where ironically it was this treasure trove of information that, that were, was shaken loose from uh, the former Soviet, Soviet Empire that pointed US investigators to a number of people in the United States. Uh, a lot of the, the most terrific um, uh, evidence from the Holocaust was buried behind the Soviet wall in, in those years. And under Glasnost, when, uh, when the United States investigators beginning in the 1980s finally began to get access to this stuff, they were basically being handled, handed a roadmap to 
uh, evidence against people here in the United States. Uh, I mentioned an encyclopedia uh, inspector, uh, encyclopedia salesman from Massachusetts, and I'll come back to him a bit later. That was a case where the Soviet records pointed out evidence in, literally in his own handwriting of his role in atrocities in Lithuania. So it was the, finally the ebbing and the thawing of the Cold War in the 1980s and 1990s that led us to a number of these Nazis in the United States and finally allowed us to, uh, to begin deporting them uh, in mass. So um, the, the, the way that I look at the story is as a battle of between cold warriors like uh, like Alan Dulles, who I will show you here. If, uh, oops. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Can I? Uh, can someone help me with the? Uh, I'm trying to. Am I using the cursor? Sorry about that. Is there a hand one that I can use? I got it there. Okay. There we go. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, that's Alan Dulles. Um, his even more famous brother was John Foster Dulles. Uh, Alan Dulles is known mainly today as the first head of the CIA uh, in the 1950s under Eisenhower. Here you see him with Kennedy not long before he got fired over the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Um, and Alan Dulles um, is... Uh, one of the main characters in my book in the early years after the war and, and sort of a villain, to be honest, because of his um, involvement with and sort of rationalization of the crimes of the Nazis. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, I meant to bring my book. Give me one second here. Um, sorry about that. Um, so... Alan Dulles, even before the war was over, uh, was, um, was someone who was thinking about the Cold War. He was the top spy official for the, what was then the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, uh, in Switzerland during the war. Um, and I tell the story early in the book of a, a remarkable meeting that he had with a top Nazi general, who you see here. Um, it, the general's name was Karl Wolf. You see him on the left with his boss on the right, Heinrich Himmler, one of the worst uh, war criminals in history. Karl Wolf was the chief of staff to Heinrich Himmler. He was also Alan Dulles's guest at a meeting in early 1945. And I'll read to you a little bit from um, a chapter of the book that is called The Good Nazis. The unholy alliance between the United States and the Nazis began with an ambitious American spy chief in Europe, a brutal Nazi general, a bottle of scotch, and a secret fireside chat at a Swiss safe house. Alan Welsh Dulles ran America's wartime espionage on Hitler inside Europe. Nazi General Karl Wolf was the feared right-hand man to SS Chief Heinrich Himmler. Together they sat by a crackling fire in the elegant library of a Zurich apartment for a pleasant conversation in early 1945. They spoke in German. America was still at war with Hitler, and the last shots of the Battle of Berlin would not be fired for another two months. But the two men, one the future director of the CIA, the other the head of the notorious Waffen-SS, uh, already had mutual interest to discuss. General Wolf realized that the war was lost, and he wanted protection from the war crimes charges that were sure to follow him. Dulles wanted Wolf's help in getting a million Nazi SS men in Italy to lay down their arms early, before what appeared to be the inevitable German surrender. Perhaps just as important in the long term, however, he saw the quote-unquote moderate Wolf as an ally in confronting the next big threat, the Russians. Wolf and his motley crew of Nazi underlings in Italy offered Dulles the promise of developing a long-term source of intelligence that could be turned against Stalin and the Russians once a post-war Germany was, found, uh, was, was formed. Um, so I tell the story of this, of this meeting and the lead up to it, which was controversial even within the United States because, uh, because at that point, uh, FDR, Stalin, and Churchill had uh, publicly declared there would be no negotiating with the Nazis. We were about to defeat them and we were uh, determined to prosecute them um, as, we, as we did in, uh, by the hundreds at Nuremberg. Um, so what, what Dulles was doing in setting up this meeting through his, uh, through his men in Zurich 
was right on the edge of open defiance of the orders from FDR not to negotiate with, with the Nazis and not to offer them any, any deals. And in fact, military men who, uh, who worked side by side with Dulles were aghast at this. Uh, the idea that he was setting up a secret meeting, ostensibly with the idea of getting the SS men in Italy to lay down their arms early. They ended up laying down their arms maybe two weeks earlier than the other than than uh, than German itself, Germany itself. Um, so there was some modest short-term gain from this, but the idea that he was meeting uh, with Karl Wolf was really anathema to the military men. So I'll read a little bit more here um, from that chapter. Um, Dulles had personally approved the secret meeting. Quote, an intelligence officer should be free to talk to the devil himself, unquote, he would later write, if he could gain useful, useful knowledge for the conduct or the termination of the war. For his part, General Wolfe was, was thrilled that Dulles had agreed to sit down with him. To prepare for the meeting, the Nazi general sent along a glowing curriculum vitae with his credentials, his wartime accomplishments with the Nazis, and even a list of character references. Among them was Pope Pius XII, whom Wolfe had met in Italy a year earlier. The documents represented what the Nazis called their Perzoschen, or detergent, meant to wipe clean the past. Wolfe's record certainly needed some scrubbing. Although Dulles was impressed by the material, some Allied officers involved in preparing for the talks were repulsed at the very thought of meeting with Wolf and vowed indignantly that they would never shake hands with the Nazi general. Dulles held no such reservations. As they met that day in Zurich under heavy guard, the two men greeted each other warmly. Sitting around the fireplace, they discussed a few mutual acquaintances before turning to the prospects for a military surrender in Italy. Dulles had the right man, the general told him. I control the SS forces in Italy, Wolf said, and he could get them to lay down their arms for him with the war all but ended. The next day, Dulles sent a secret telegram to Washington <coughs> recapping what he excitedly viewed as a big breakthrough meeting with Wolf. Much of the memo was devoted to how impressed he was with the Nazi general, a rose-colored view that ignored the many atrocities he had directed. Quote, Wolf is a distinctive personality, Dulles wrote, and dynamic, too. Our reports and impressions indicate that he represents a more moderate element in the Waffen-SS with a mixture of romanticism. The general's aim, Dulles cabled, was to help lead Germany out of war and, quote, end the useless material and human destruction. Wolf was handsome and trustworthy, too, Dulles added later, and the Allies would be able to work with him. Those who had met him could plainly see that Wolf was, quote, no ogre. Dulles was also duly impressed by Wolf's Nazi deputies, the senior black order officers who had arranged this meeting. He learned that Nazi Captain Guido Zimmer, quote, despite his membership in the SS, was a devout Catholic. Zimmer, somewhat of an intellectual, was moved by a desire to save the art and religious treasures of Italy from ruin if the war continued, Dulles wrote. Quote, Zimmer seemed to be a misfit in the SS. He was good looking, clean cut, not the way one pictures the typical SS officer. So with Dulles's help, Wolfe uh, Wolf managed to, as he had set out to do, save his own skin. Originally at Nuremberg, after the war, uh, Wolfe was listed as one of the top 12 defendants, um, along with 11 other men who were ultimately executed. Wolf was the man whose main accomplishment in Nazi Germany was to, set it, was to put in motion the horrific train apparatus that took millions to their deaths at, at camps like Auschwitz. He was the man who, um, who literally set up the network on behalf of Himmler. Yet with Dulles's protection after the war in what Dulles saw as uh, a debt of gratitude to the Nazi general, um, Wolf instead became a witness to the atrocities, not one of the 12 original defendants, but a witness. And in fact, he uh, lived for years and years afterwards freely, and it was only the West Germans that prosecuted in the 1960s, not the United States. And this is a long, complicated story that, I, that I'll try and sum up for you in the book, but he, he had to live for a couple of years in, um, in a POW camp, although what that meant for Wolf was that he was allowed to continue wearing his German uniform. He even carried a sidearm. And sometimes he would go to a lake uh, and go bo boating on the weekends in Austria uh, with other German officers while he was ostensibly a US prisoner. But he was, even while he avoided the uh, possible execution at Nuremberg, he was bitter about this, believe it or not. Uh, and he blamed Dulles for having break, broken supposedly a deal that he had made with him to keep his uh, to keep him out of custody, not only keep him alive, but keep him a free man. 
Um, and he, in fact, complained directly to Wolf and to his other underlings that they had broken this promise at the end of the war to keep him free. And what he wrote was this. He said, um, he wrote that he was a leading general in the Third Reich and he demanded to be treated like one. He was the true victim, he thundered to one allied interrogator in 1947, two years after the war. His continued confinement as a POW after handing Italy to Dulles and the Americans on, quote, a silver platter was worse than anything the Jews ever faced under Hitler, he blustered. Quote, a Jew is killed in the gas chamber in a few seconds without having an idea or even knowing it. My comrades and I have been allowed to die once every night for 21 months. This is much more inhumane than the extermination of the Jews. And even more remarkably, he sent Dulles a bill for what he said was money owed to him for his lost wages during his 21 months in captivity uh, and uh, the clothes and other artifacts that he had to give up. Dulles was not amused by his wartime partner's hubris. Wolf, he said, quote, doesn't realize what a lucky man he is not to be spending the rest of his days in jail. And his wisest policy would be to keep fairly quiet about the loss of a bit of underwear, et cetera. He might easily have lost more than his shirt. So this was really the beginning of this view of the quote unquote moderate Nazis, um, even before the war was over. And it was an attitude, as, as stunning as that now seems 70 years later, that took hold among US intelligence officials, that there was a moderate wing of the Nazi party who um, not only should, were not deserving of prosecution at Nuremberg, but could actually help the United States in this new Cold War effort. Um, another early proponent of this idea was you see here General Patton um, on the right with his boss at that time, General Eisenhower, immediately after the war. I tell the story in the book of Patton um, about six months after the, the end of the war, he was running the prison camps where uh, Nazi POWs were held, sometimes side by side with Jewish survivors in the DB camps who were treated uh, horrifically in, in subhuman standards that are tough to imagine today. I'll leave that talk for another day. But, but Patton had this sort of odd admiration for the Nazis under his command. I tell the story in the book of going to the bunk, a barracks where German scientists were kept. And he calls out the leading Ger German scientist, the man by the name of Walter Dornberger. And he says, are you the man who, who built the, v, the V1 rockets for Hitler? And Dornberger says, jawohl, Herr General. And he says, he, pick, he takes three cigars out of his pocket and he hands them to the Nazi general and he says, well, congratulations, we couldn't have done it. And in fact, within a few months, Dornberger, along with his protege, who you might have heard of, Werner von Braun, and hundreds of other Nazi scientists were en route to the United States. Here's one of them um, in a photo. Sorry, these are a little bit out of order. Here, here you see a bunch of the Nazi scientists in what was called Operation Paperclip. On the right is Werner von Braun uh, with the uh, kerchief, a, a dashing, almost charismatic figure, brilliant scientist, played piano, classical piano, scuba do, became legendary in the United States uh, on a, the Disney Sunday morning specials uh, as, as this new age scientist. His sort of uh, uh, engineer under him is the left there, a man by the name of Arthur Rudolph, who you see <laughs> There, that's Arthur Rudolph's Nazi identification card. So the Pentagon brought in hundreds of Nazi scientists. Originally this was supposed to be a small time affair, maybe a couple of dozen people, they told the State Department in, in late 1945, to exploit the technological capabilities that the Germans had brought to the war, where, where they had brought uh, jet propulsion technology unlike anything the West had ever seen and used those to bomb London, Antwerp, all over Europe and the United States wanted to capitalize on this. So they started bringing hundreds of these Nazi scientists, including Arthur Rudolph and Werner von Braun, to the United States. This was at first a secret program, but it became difficult uh, to hide 1,600 men in white lab coats and with German accents in places like Huntsville, Alabama, and Texas. And so within about six months, the, the program was outed. And the Pentagon did a masterful bit, bit of public relations at that point. They not only acknowledged that the program existed, but they took credit for it and um, essentially whitewashed the pasts of 
Rudolf, uh, Werner von Braun, Walter Dernberger, and others. These became, uh, in the official policy of the United States that was approved first by Truman and then by Eisenhower in the 1950s, uh, these were Nazis who were not ardent Nazis, quote unquote ardent Nazis. They were, the, the military was suggesting, Nazis in name only. They may have had identification cards, but they hadn't been involved in any of the horrendous stuff. Now what that really meant in practice, not being involved in horrendous stuff and not being an ardent Nazi, in the case of someone like Arthur Rudolph, meant that you were the production manager at a horrible slave labor camp in Nazi Germany called Nordhausen, Middle, Middleburg, in a place in a mountain called Nordhausen, where some 10,000 slave laborers died and tens of thousands built these missiles for Hitler and Rudolf and von Braun. Uh, Rudolf was the man who would wa walk the assembly lines and would make sure that the workers, most of them were not, were not Jews, but were POWs often from France, Russia, Poland, uh, and elsewhere, were doing their jobs. Um, and they died every day. There were 20 or 30 who died either of starvation or malnutrition, disease. They were, they were sleeping side by side in this hideous mountain cavern. Um, disease was everywhere. Uh, so there were 20 or 30 dying a day. Those who were suspected of sabotaging the equipment in this mountain factory, um, as the SS commanders thought some of the prisoners were doing, were brought to the center of the factory where the huge cranes were, were standing. All the other prisoners were gathered around by the SS and they were hanged from the top of the crane as a message to anyone else who might uh, try and manipulate or sabotage the equipment and not meet their quotas for the day. So Arthur Rudolph was the man working side by side as an engineer with the SS in making sure that they met their, their quotas for the day. And I, and I tell the story in the book of um, his becoming quite upset one New Year's Eve because he had to go back to the factory to deal with some mechanical issue and his, uh, his party with schnapps and some local German girls was spoiled because he had to deal with some malfunction that the slave laborers had, had uh, foisted upon him. So the, these were the type of people who were, in the view of the US military, not ardent Nazis. Um, von Braun himself was the man who would requisition the number of workers that they needed to meet Hitler's quota of, um, of B-1 rockets. And towards the end of the war, as Hitler was growing more and more desperate, uh, von Braun was the man who would say that if you, needed if you wanted 500 rockets that month instead of 400, that was going to mean X thousand more POWs, which inevitably meant not only X thousand being taken to Nordhausen, but hundreds among that group dying of starvation, of malnutrition, of disease, and sometimes of hanging. Um, so von Braun, for years and years after the war, was a legendary figure in the United States, and his past was essentially erased through the help of the Pentagon. Um, he became a Nazi in name only, not the man who had actually run a slave labor camp and requisitioned the workers to build, to build the missiles. Um, let me tell you about a few of the other Nazis who made it into the United States. Um, this is a guy by the name of Walter Hilger. You see him here in his Nazi garb. He was the number two uh, German foreign affairs specialist on the Soviet Union to uh, General Ribbentrop. Uh, Ribbentrop was tried at Nuremberg and executed, but Hilger, who was with Hitler at the end of the war in the bunker, not only escaped prosecution, but came to the United States and lived in Washington for years and years as a secret CIA analyst. He would go out to Langley uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, if you look at the files that, um, that are in the National Archives, uh, in the early 1950s, mid-1950s, and he would brief the CIA on, uh, on Soviet affairs. He was even listed in the white pages. He was so um, uh, uh, immune to any real scrutiny he, he ex essentially acknowledged his past with the Soviets when he was challenged on it, uh, I'm sorry, with the Germans, when he was challenged on it years later, but he said that the work he was doing for the United States in combating the Soviets as part of the Cold War basically nullified all that. And he said at one point, he wrote in his own memoirs years later, he had nothing to apologize for. Um, this is another figure who made it into the United States. This is the Massachusetts Encyclopedia salesman I was telling you about, Alexander Lalekas. On the, on the left, you see his military photo in Lithuania, and he was the head of a notorious uh, secret security police force known as the Segumas. Um, Lalekas was the man who would, uh, as the police chief, order his men to round up all the Jews in and around Vilnius, 60,000 of them, 
and have them jailed at a local jail in Vilnius and then turned over to the Gestapo. Uh, his signature was on hundreds and hundreds of those orders, many of them women and children. Uh, there was a, an eight-year-old girl named Gita Kaplan. His signature, Alexander Lelikis' signature, is, is on the order having her jailed. She and 59,999 others were then marched about seven miles outside of town, outside of Vilnius, to a place called Panerai, which was an old tank ditch, and lined up execution style and killed. This is one of the pictures from Panerai. Alexander Lelikis not only made it into the United States, but worked for the CIA. He was among those class, as I talked about earlier, of about 1,000 ex-Nazis and Nazi collaborators who were seen as new cold warriors uh, in uh, US intelligence operations after the war. He worked uh, for the CIA in Austria uh, and elsewhere in Europe in the 1950s. He got paid about $1,200 a month plus a carton of cigarettes, which was part of his contract. And the CIA then helped him move to the United States. Um, they said at that point that moving to the United States and essentially whitewashing his records so that the INS wouldn't, um, wouldn't ban him was what they said a reward for his loyal service to the CIA in Austria, according to the documents that were classified at the time. And in view of what they called the innocuousness, that's their word, not mine, the innocuousness of his work for the Nazis. Right there in the CIA's own files from around 1951 are notations that Alexander Lekas was known to be a top Nazi collaborator with the Gestapo and was probably involved in the massacre of hundreds of Jews at Vilnius. Of course, hundreds actually turned out to be more like 60,000. This was not news to the CIA. They knew that. They moved him to the United States anyway. They even put him up with a military family in Boston for a period of months um, before he then moved to Massachusetts. Uh, and it was another 30 years when, as I mentioned earlier, the Cold War began to ebb and these files began to open up that anyone was able to place Alexander Lelikas um, at the scene of Nazi killings. And he was finally, only in 1995, deported back to Lithuania to stand trial for war crimes. He died while he was on trial, 40 years after he came to the United States. This is another, um, another Nazi who I read about extensively in the book, Otto von Bolschwin. He was a Prussian baron who worked as a top aide to this man, Adolf Eichmann. Uh, von Bolschwing was sort of the thinker of the Nazi party. He was in the late 1930s uh, in what was called the SD's Jewish Affairs Office. And it was his job to write these hideous white papers for Eichmann describing ways to terrorize the Jews to the point that they would be forced to flee Germany and Europe. This was prior to the indoctrination of the concentration camps. And in fact, at his ultimate trial in Israel in 1961, Eichmann credited uh, von Bolschwing as someone who had tried to come up with a more humane solution. A more humane solution being this policy paper called The Jewish Problem, in which, in which von Bolschwing wrote that a largely anti-Jewish atmosphere must be created among the people in order to form the basis for the continued attack and the effective exclusion of the Jews. The most effective means is the anger of the people leading to ex excesses in order to take away the sense of security from the Jews. Even though this is an illegal method, it has had a long-standing effect. So von Bolschwing was a strategy guy for the Nazis and also went operational later. He went to Romania where he helped in um, a horrific pogrom that left hundreds and hundreds of Jews literally hanging from meat hooks. And he helped um, the... Uh, the, the men who were actually responsible for, for that, including one who ended up in Michigan, uh, to flee the scene and gave them cover at a safe haven before he left the area. Now, von Bolschwing, like others, realized towards the end of the war that they were about to lose. And he did what others, including, um, including Lelakis, did, which was to begin to cozy up to US officials and painting himself as uh, an anti-Nazi Nazi resistor and an American, uh, American ally. As with uh, Alexander Lelakis, this worked. And von Bolschwing, like Lelakis, was a spy for the United States in Europe during the war. Um, although, in the case of, as in the case of many other of these guys, not a very good one. I tell the story in the book uh, in 1954 in Austria of von Bolschwing being dispatched by the CIA 
to deliver a satchel full of top secret documents, photos, uh, papers that had the, the actual names of US secret operatives on them. He was supposed to del deliver this to a contact in Hamburg on a train. He gets to Hamburg and he realizes that his satchel has been, uh, uh, has been swapped uh, with another man's. And instead of the spy documents inside, he opens it up and there's men's pajamas and a bag of toiletries. And uh, this was uh, the cause of, of a, a light hand slapping by the United States. They didn't fire him. Uh, they warned him he should be more careful in the future about guarding secret documents. But they, like Lalekis, moved him to the United States and helped him uh, to start a new life where he was su a successful businessman in, uh, in New York City using the export-import business, using, using knowledge of the international trade that he gained, ironically, with the Nazis during the war. Uh, and I tell another story in the book of what happened after his former boss, Adolf Eichmann, was finally caught in 1960 by the Israelis. Um, von Bolschwing became worried, quite understandably, that the Israelis, who had just mounted this amazing raid into Argentina to capture Eichmann, might come after him too, because he was worried that his own name was about to come out at trial, which in fact it did. Eichmann named him four times at his trial. Um, so von Bolschwing did what any um, ex-Nazi spy would do. He went back to the CIA for help. He called uh, his old handler in Washington, and he met with two CIA officials in New York at a restaurant in 1961, and he told them he needed help because the Israelis had just come after his old boss, and he was worried they might come after him too. Now, the CIA didn't tell the Israelis who von Bolschwing was or where he was. They didn't tell the INS or the US Justice Department or the, uh, or the local prosecutors in New York. They didn't tell anyone. They, they assured von Bolschwing that they would protect his cover and not tell anyone who he was on one condition. By that point, von Bolschwing had become so successful in the United States in international business that he was about to be nominated by the State Department for a posting in India uh, with an international business development unit. Um, and the CIA said if, if von Bolschwing wanted their continued silence, he had to drop his nomination for that job. They would protect him, but only if he went, basically um, went, went off the radar and did not make himself a public figure in the way that he was about to do. So von Bolschwing, believe it or not, objected at first. He said, I've earned this job. Why should I have to give up this, this cool job in India? Finally, the CIA, through a bit of essentially blackmail, said, you either drop this or we go to the Israelis. Well, he dropped the job. They didn't go to the Israelis. And it was another 25 years before anyone in the United States figured out who Otto von Bolschwing was or, or what he had done with Adolf Eichmann during the war. By that point, he was living in a nursing home on his deathbed in, outside Sacramento. And it was just months before he died that the US uh, Justice Department, through a new office that had just been created in 1979, finally confronted him. And, and uh, his son convinced him to admit in the most generic of terms uh, what he had done with the Nazis. N not specific acts, mind you, but just admit that he had served with the SS, he had served with the SD, he had concealed his Nazi party membership. He, was agreed, to, he agreed to do that much. He gave up his US citizenship, but because of his failing health, the United States showed him, I'd say, a, a fair amount of sympathy and mercy and allowed him to die in the United States. Uh, nearly 35 years after the war. I could go on and on, unfortunately, with examples that are almost as disturbing as von Bolschwing and Lalekis and Walter Hilger and others, but the point is that for 25 years after the war, the United States was essentially <coughs> indifferent to the, to the existence of hundreds and hundreds of Nazis and Nazi collaborators in the United States, some of them with the knowing uh, role of the CIA and the FBI. I've talked mostly about the CIA, but the FBI used dozens of uh, ex-Nazis as FBI informants. One of them I write about a lot in the book was a guy in New Jersey named Tom Subsikoff, um, who was an anti-communist tipster. He had worked before the war as the head of an SS execution squad, um, in, first in the Caucasus, where he was from, and then later in, in Austria and Hungary and Poland. Um, and he uh, was someone who cozied up first with the CIA, he worked for the CIA as a spy, then for the FBI, then for the city of Patterson, New Jersey, where he was a, a top city official. Um, and he basically lived with an impunity for years and years without any, um, any real fear of exposure until the late 1970s, where, as I mentioned, um, through the, the work of people like Elizabeth Holtzman in Congress, hearings began uh, in, in Washington uh, 
trying to expose what had been this shameful national secret, the, the ease with which hundreds of thousands of Nazis had gotten into the United States and the fact that no one really cared. Um, and the Justice Department in 1979 set up a whole new office to begin looking at these people. And they opened hundreds and hundreds of investigations into people like Arthur Rudolph and Tom Sudzikoff and Alexander Lalekis and Otto von Bolschwing. But that's where Pat Buchanan comes into, into uh, play here. And the Cold War resurfaces because you have Pat Buchanan uh, going after what he liked to call the hairy-chested Nazi hunters at the Justice Department and really making their lives quite difficult. Arthur Rudolph was the first and the last uh, member of the paperclip scientific team to ever be prosecuted by the Justice Department. At the point where they went after Arthur Rudolph, who at that point was, was living uh, in California uh, and was drawing a pension not only from the Nazis but from the US government and NASA, um, there were more than a dozen investigations into other uh, US scientists who had been, been with the Nazis. Um, Werner von Braun himself had died just a few years earlier, so, so he was not investigated just by, by virtue of timing. Uh, but a dozen others were. There was such a backlash from Pat Buchanan and the White House at that point that all those other investigations shut down. Uh, and Rudolph was, as I said, the first and last Nazi scientist to ever face prosecution in the United States. Um, I, I don't want uh, uh, to leave you the idea that this book is all about villains. There are a few Actually, I should mention one more before I turn to that. This is another Nazi scientist uh, by the name of Hubertus Strughold. Um, what Werner von Braun was to, uh, to building the rockets, Hubertus Strughold was to keeping st uh, astronauts alive in space. The way he plied his trade was with the Nazis uh, as a top aviation uh, doctor in, uh, in Nuremberg. And he would use the uh, experiments that were conducted on prisoners, mostly at Dachau, including children who were put inside a flight simulator, not unlike this one. The one you see there is in Texas, because by that point, in the late 19, uh, beginning of the 1940s, Strughold was a renowned space scientist as part of this Operation Paperclip in Texas. Uh, he, there was even a day named after him in, in Texas because of his contributions to space medicine. He was known as the father of modern space medicine. Um, and his connections to these horrible human experiments with the Nazis during the war were completely whitewashed, along with um, the records of people like Werner von Braun and Arthur Rudolph. Um, so I mentioned that there, there are a few heroes among all the villains in the book. This was someone I'd never heard of before I started my research. It's a guy by the name of Chuck Allen. Um, who was a left-wing journalist in the early 1960s. He wrote for um, publications like The Nation, is probably the only one you've ever heard of, along with some communist-leaning ones, some Jewish publications. And before this was in vogue, he was writing about Nazis in the United States. In 1963, he wrote this 42-page expose, which named names, uh, at that point, of 16 prominent Nazis living in the United States, including a a uh, clergyman in Chicago, uh, Walter Kilger, the guy at the CIA, and, and others. Now, the mainstream media uh, ignored Chuck Allen and what he wrote, but the FBI didn't ignore him. What the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover did was to go after uh, Chuck Allen. Sorry, I'm a little out of order here. There you see J. Edgar Hoover on the left with Nixon. Um, and they declared him a communist subversive, and they ordered years of wiretaps on him when he would get packages sent from Eastern Europe with possible evidence and paperwork against people in the United States, the Postal Service and the FBI, under order by J. Edgar Hoover, would open his mail, thumb through it, and try and build a case against him. I tell another story in the book of his leaving um, the Russian embassy after a meeting to develop evidence against that New Jersey guy I told you about, Tom Zupsikoff, and there was an FBI agent asleep in the car um, out front because he had been trailing him for days and Chuck Allen knocks on the guy's window and says, I'm all done, we're leaving now. Um, so Allen was, was not only a journalist, but he was a, an, an activist in sort of the tradition of left-wing journalists. So here you see on the right, this is a poster that he, he, uh, fr from a rally that he held in Chicago, I think this was Brooklyn. He held rallies in Chicago, Brooklyn, and Los Angeles to draw attention to this. But he was met with um, not only surveillance, secret surveillance by the FBI, but staunch protests from ethnic groups who believed that they were being attacked. If you were Lithuanian or Estonian or Latvian, as many of the Nazi collaborators were, um, you're, uh, oftentimes the ethnic communities in those cities rallied to your defense. This was seen as a Russian 
plot, essentially communist subversives who were attempting to destroy and smear good men like Alexander Lelikas or Tom Subsikoff. Um, so Alan actually got into a fist fight in one of the, uh, the rallies in Chicago uh, with a bunch of neo-Nazis who didn't like the idea that he was trying to out Nazis. And it was another 20 years after Chuck Allen um, first printed his expose before the United States really began going after these guys in earnest. And of course, you're left to wonder if that initiative in 1979, 1980 had been launched uh, 25 years earlier. Would people like Otto von Bolschwing and Alexander Lelikas and Tom Subsikoff have been able to live out their, their lives in America uh, divorced from their, their pasts as, as Nazis? Um, and that's, that's the sad reality of, uh, uh, of the situation that, that uh, this book tries to address. So with that, uh, I think we can open up for questions if you want. Yeah. Yes, hi. hi uh, thank, you <clears throat> thank you very much for being here. And, thank you for uh, having me. Welcome back. Thank you. And, uh, with all the great work you've done on Trevally, I thought an irony that uh, our bookstore couldn't take my cash for your book. <laughs> since I'm yeah. a retired naval officer, I don't have nothing to hide, so I, I can use my credit card freely. So if anybody's Trevally. OK, OK. <clears throat> Let's not stop there. Let's go further afield. If those 10,000 hadn't come to the United States and the argument could be made, thank God that somebody was thinking of this great plan because they turned out to be, I hate to say it, pretty good citizens uh, if that uh, assisting us in the Cold War. If, if we can take those in, uh, more than enough countries would have opened up their arms. Probably it's easier to count those that didn't open up their arms, notably Britain and its empire, Australia, Canada, from what I know, they didn't really welcome them. But uh, perhaps one of the ironies to it is uh, uh, the, the technical assistance I've heard to South Africa for the bomb, for gasification technology. Irony of it, France, uh, the, the, the assistance they provided Israel with their uh, bomb program in the 60s. I know it's, it's pretty much factual that Israel held that, held the threat of revealing collaboration with the French politicians. So you're on volume one here. If you expand it to private industry and out to other countries, wow, it's a, it's a longer, bigger story. Right. And if you want to reveal <clears throat> anything like you're, you're having plans or, or something we don't know in public, just to let you know you're among friends here. And none of us will, <laughs> we're we're, just all, we're off the record, are we? You okay, all right. Sure this isn't going to be in the Daily Orange? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, well, well the, certainly the mindset was that, that when it came to the, the German technology that the U.S. needed to exploit that. And I think that's the one area where um, you can make a case that if we put the morality aside, if we hold our noses and say we don't care what they did with the Nazis, this was a benefit to the United States. And I think that's more of a, a philosophical argument than, than one that I sort of tried to get into in the book. I, 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 I tried to sort of capture the, the attitude of people like Alan Dulles and I think that, that um, you know, as perverse as that was in a lot of ways, uh, there was a clear technological benefit, whether we got to the moon two years or three years or four years earlier than we might have with, without the Nazis, um, you know, I think is, is difficult to say, and I'm not a position, in a position to say that. I contrast the scientists that you're talking about mostly with like the CIA spies who, um, you know, we, we didn't care about their morality because we thought they could help us in this new Cold War, and in fact, that many of them did real damage. As I mentioned, a few of them were Soviet double agents. Um, you know, they were losing spy documents on trains. They were bumbling assignments in the Middle East. Um, and so the, the uh, aims of developing intelligence in the Soviets were, uh, were actually counterproductive in those cases. There, were no, there was no technological um, or, or national security benefit in my view. Oh. Yes. Uh, what do you know about the scale of uh, the Soviet uh, employment of ex-Nazis in their scientific... Uh, well, the, the, the Soviets were, were, were certainly um, were luring and in some cases even grabbing Nazi scientists. That, that was part of the fear that drove people like Alan Dulles. There were reports that the, that the, the Russians were literally kidnapping um, scientists and bringing them uh, and bringing them to Moscow, and they were certainly in, enticing them with, um, you know, lucrative pay packages. And we were, we were doing the same. Uh, what's interesting to me is that um, 
that the, the project, uh, project paperclip, was unique in, in history up to that point. It had always been um, you know, the case that if you won the war, you were gonna try and exploit the, the knowledge and the science of the other guys, you know, to the, win, to, to the victor go the spoils. Usually you did that on, on the battlefield, in, in, in the region. You, know, you, you, would, you would grab their technology, you'd grab their diagrams, you'd grab their blueprints, you'd, you'd interrogate them and debrief them, maybe even torture them, who knows. What we did that was different with Operation Paperclip was that we brought all those people to the United States, not for a limited period of time, but for their lifetimes, we basically promised them U.S. citizenship. There's, there's one guy that I write about in the book from, from the Air Force who, who told uh, Dr. Strokel, you know, once you come here, you will be in America. Some of these guys had the chance to go back years and years later. They didn't want to. They, they had their own, uh, their own communities set up in Alabama. There's a place in Alabama uh, outside Huntsville known as Kraut Hill because there were so many Germans there, or, or in San Antonio, Texas. And we, um, you know, even after they'd stopped giving us any valuable uh, technology, you know, they lived out their lives here. As, as I mentioned, uh, Arthur Rudolph, you know, was collecting a NASA pension and a Social Security pension um, for years uh, after after his retirement from NASA. Um, Werner von Braun the same before he died. Um, so yes, the, the the Russians were certainly doing the same, as, as were the French and even the, the British uh, were were trying to lure. Uh, we're trying to lure scientists, and we were competing with our own allies. Um, the, the French and the British and the Russians, at that point, were, had gone from allies to enemies very quickly. Um, so this was this, this new space race, and the Germans were the, the, the pride, prize of the class. Yes? Why, why was the U.S. so far why behind? Was the US so, uh, you know what, that was a little bit outside my mandate. I, I, I think that, um, I'm not sure the U.S., I'm not sure I'd say the U.S. is so far behind, it was that von Braun was so far ahead. He was doing things with, with jet propulsion that no one else in the United States or anyone else was doing. Um, and, you know, what, what Hitler was able to unlaunch, um, uh, to, to, to unleash in Europe was sort of a technological marvel. Um, and the U.S. wanted to, uh, capture that for itself. So, yes. One, one of the points you make in the book is that in, in the in the successful cases, they were they, they weren't tried here. They weren't tried for war crimes or anything. Right. Like that. Not, they were they were deported, and it was difficult to find to find uh, countries that would try them. Right. Right. And then, and then you have you have the case of Sultikov, mm -hmm. who gets off for a while because he has admitted. Right, when right. he came into the country, recognizing that he was a top Nazi operative. You're a close reader. You should give the talk. He's, he's really, you're digging deep into the book. I like that. Yeah, and, and what, what raises the question is, what did they sign? What did they sign when they, when, when they came to the country? Well, the way, yeah, you're, you're, you're raising uh, important issues of the, the, the legal quandary that the United States found itself in, especially years later when they tried to go back and deport these guys. I, I could do a whole separate talk at the law school maybe next time on, uh, on these difficult issues of immigration and deportation. Um, and uh, the sad reality was that even once the United States started to go after these guys in the late 1970s and early 1980s, there was no war crime statute on the books that would allow us to prosecute them. That's still true to some extent. I actually did just, just did a story a few weeks ago in the New York Times on Bosnian war criminals. That's still a problem, is that it's difficult to prosecute them, and usually your, your, best, um, uh, your best hope is to deport them. But as, as you indicate, that became a huge problem for U.S. immigration officials in the 1980s because no one wanted them back. Um, even the Germans wouldn't take them back. They, oops, sorry, I quote some of the book saying, you know, why would we take your Nazi garbage off your hands? And, and his U.S. counterpart said, because you created them, because you, you made this problem. And they said, so what? And, and believe it or not, it wasn't until about five years ago, uh, what, 65 years after the war or so, that the Germans began actively going after um, former SS officers. And now they have about 80 active investigations against guys who are now in their late 80s or early 90s, whereas they, they did nothing essentially for years. Even Israel didn't want back most of these guys. They wanted back big fish, Adolf Eichmann type level guys. There weren't that many of them. Um, so the process um, was agonizingly slow. Where even if you could bring a case against someone like the New Jersey guy or others, um, that they had entered the country illegally by concealing their Nazi ties, even if you could take away their citizenship, because a lot of these guys actually became citizens by, by the 1970s, um, you then had to find some place to take them back. So deporting, so deporting them 
was half the battle. So there's a guy that I met with up in Queens, who's now about 89 years old, who was stripped of his citizenship probably eight years ago. No one will take him back. He lives in this, this decrepit old brownstone in, in Queens, uh, and I'm sure he'll die here. Maybe tomorrow someone will take him back. But there are dozens and dozens of cases like that where guys are effectively stateless because they were found to be Nazis in the 70s or 80s or 90s. Um, they've been stripped of their citizenship, but no country will take them back, and there's nothing to do with them. So the, the legal issues here are, are just um, you know, daunting and, and incredibly frustrating. So let, let, me do, let me go around first, and then we'll come back to you. Did someone else have? I thought I saw someone in the back. Yes. Yeah, that, that is interesting um, that, that uh, um, Alan Dulles' law firm and John Klaus Dulles' law firm did business with, with big German corporations, um, represented them in, in international matters. I even tell the story um, at that meeting in Zurich where Alan Dulles is meeting with General Wolf. Um, one part I didn't mention in there is that uh, uh, General Wolf said to him, well, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll get my men to surrender early in Italy. I also have these, these bank notes for millions of, of uh, uh, well, the equivalent of millions of dollars, I, I forget which cur what currency they're in, which he probably seized from dead Jews, to be honest. And he asked Alan Dulles, could he help him out with these? So Alan Dulles actually wrote a secret cable back to Washington saying, let's see if we can take care of his stash of, of secret, uh, uh, secret bonds and, and stocks. Um, so clearly Dulles had, had all sorts, as you say, uh, business dealings before the war and even during the war with with Germans, um, and he's you know he had this view of you know in his words the moderate Nazis, which is almost you know uh, unbelievable to think about now. Um, you know the guys he was we we, we had just waged you know a four year war against. He was ready to, if not forgive, at least forget. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't focus specifically on that. The question is, what, what's the attitude of, of people in Germany today? I mean, my, my sense from, from German Americans I know is that there really has been quite a coming to terms of this. I mean, it's taught in school from the <coughs> earliest age. You know, it's, it's illegal in Germany to be a member of the Nazi party. You know, the, the free speech is not, it's not an issue when it comes to that. Um, you know, I think there's obviously a, a tremendous sense of, of guilt and national shame and the realization that that will always be a part of their their culture. I'm sure there are people who might think that's too rose-colored a view and, and uh, you know, really there's still closet Nazis, you know, everywhere there. But my sense is that, that they really have taken ownership of that, even to the extent, as I said, in the last few years of going after 90-year-old men who used to be concentration camp guards. And that's, that's a recent development. Yes? How do you account for the Be because of the immigration policies, and I was talking about that earlier with, with the floodgates of, of visas opening from those, those captive nations that Hitler had occupied after the war. And it was, it was very, very easy. Uh, there were something like 400,000 visas um, that were approved in the late 1940s, just a few years after the war, from that, that region, from the Baltics and Eastern Europe. Um, and at the same time, uh, I'll talk about this more tonight, but, but at the same time, the Holocaust survivors in the DP camps after the war in Germany, it was incredibly difficult to get out. So you had this horrible irony of, of thousands of Nazi collaborators making it into America as supposed war refugees, while survivors were kept in deplorable conditions for months. And some of them were kept in these DP camps for five or six years because the United States wouldn't take them. There was a, there was a real crackdown. There were, lawmakers who openly did not want Jews in the United States. There's you know, congressional record statements on that. Um, and they believed that these Eastern Europeans were staunch anti-communists. They were people of quote unquote good breeding and good stock. Um, and uh, it was very easy for them to get in. And it's clear that you know, if, if, even, if even one in a hundred uh, of the refugees was, was a Nazi, that's thousands of Nazis. Um, they were, you know, I mentioned the Estonian who was uh, the head of the concentration camp guard, Alexander Lelakis was the head of the Lithuanian police, um, and, and on and on. So the, so the reality is that 
of the thousands of Nazis who got into the United States, most of them were no doubt Eastern Europeans, not Germans per se. They were Eastern Europeans who were, um, if not SS in uniform, they were top Nazi collaborators like Lakas, the head of the, the uh, collaborationist police. Yes? You think uh, that Chuck Allen, what's his name? Yes. Uh, tried to organize a public response. Yes. You, 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 don't, you don't tell us that in the, in the Justice Department, the top people who were doing the work were, were Jews, that Elizabeth Holtzman, Jewish representative of Brooklyn. Right. What was the response of the Jewish community during this period? Was, it, was there an organized response from the Jewish community? It, in the period in the 60s when Chuck Allen, who's not Jewish, was, was trying to draw attention to this, there was relatively little from the Jewish community. I, mean, I, think, I think, and this is uh, perhaps a, a bigger topic than my book um, set out to answer, but, but it, it wasn't really until, and Allen has more profound thoughts than I do on this, but, but it wasn't really until the 1970s that, that you, know, you began to openly hear Jews talking about the Holocaust. Is that, is that a fair... My sense is you, you had the Holocaust mini-series in, in 1977, which was public, huge. Public awareness of the Holocaust. Yeah. Jews public. were talking about it, but in Yiddish and yeah. in Yiddish papers, right. but the American public and American Jews, not until Anne Frank is published in 54 or something like that. Yeah. So it was, yeah, even in many families, you know, if, you're, if your father was a survivor, you, you know, I talked to many people who said, you know, you didn't really talk about it in the 50s or 60s or 70s. It wasn't really until the late 70s when you had like miniseries, you had McNeil Lair reports, you had Elizabeth Holtzman holding hearings, um, that this whole issue of, of the Holocaust and Nazis in our midst really, um, really came out of the closet. And, and you know, that was 15 years after Chuck Allen was doing what he was doing in Brooklyn and Chicago and Los Angeles. So, yes, David. The Nazis were next door, and some of them built families and had oh, yeah. children. Oh, yeah. And many of the children, as you described, knew nothing about it. And you had one very interesting vignette about a, a Hollywood director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I uh, spent a lot of time talking to the children of these, uh, of these Nazis, um, uh, who, for the most part, uh, I'm convinced, knew nothing of it. I, I, don't, I don't just mean like, oh, yeah, we knew nothing, wink, wink. I, I really think they knew nothing. I spent a lot of time with um, the son of, of uh, Otto von Bolschwing, um, who was a lawyer in... Uh, in California, who actually represented his father originally, and of course thought, like most of these people, that his father was innocent, they, there, there must be a mistake, or the, these were fraudulent documents from the communists, or what have you. But he finally came to believe that his father, in fact, was this horrible monster that the Justice Department made him out to be, and it was really this, this um, awakening and this reckoning for him that he deals with even today, knowing who his father really was. Um, and the, the, the case that you're talking about involving a Hollywood filmmaker was um, uh, Joe Esterhaus. He's not exactly a household name now, but in the 1980s, 1990s, he was like the biggest Hollywood screenwriter going. He did um, Fatal Attraction, I think Basic Instinct, a bunch of like splashy Hollywood films. But he did a, a much smaller movie um, around 1983 with Jessica Lange called uh, The Music Box, which was about a man accused of being a Nazi and his own daughter representing him. And as Esther has told the story later, this wasn't in any way meant to be a personal or sort of you know, a, a personal um, uh, memoir. He knew that his family was from, from Hungary and had come over after the Holocaust. They, they weren't Jews, they, they were, uh, I think, Orthodox, I'm forgetting the ethnicity, but Christian. Um, and uh, so he does this movie, and then he finds out just a year later, the Justice Department in around 1982, comes calling at his father's door in Cleveland. And he finds out that his father was the Nazi's top propagandist in Hungary. He held the official title of Nazi spokesman. And he had just, just made this movie two years earlier that was watched by everyone. And then he, and, you know, you talk about life imitating art. I mean, that, that was uh, enormously uh, uh, you know, heart-wrenching for him. Um, he, you know, he was sort of this, this uh, splashy Hollywood boy, and after that, he became much more, much more subdued when he realized sort of how close that had all come to him. So, yes. You may not know this, but I'd be curious to know how many ex-Nazis may have emigrated from Germany and changed their names 
I, I think it's a minority. I mean, there, there were certainly some who, who, cha who changed their name to try and get into the United States. The, the, the most prominent one I can think of um, is a guy who was in Southern California named uh, Andre Artukovich, who was probably the Nazi in the United States with the most blood on his hands of anyone. He was the uh, a top interior minister in Nazi-occupied uh, Croatia, and he was the guy who set up the concentration camps um, uh, not just Jews, but probably the majority of the victims were Serbs. Um, so there, there were uh, probably upwards of 600,000 um, who were imprisoned and killed <coughs> under his watch. Um, and he just put a false name on his visa application and lived in California for, for years. Um, but most of them didn't really have to change their names. Um, there, there was no scrutiny. It, it, the, the, the checks for you know, determining your past were really minimal, and this is true even today. I mentioned the story I just did a few weeks ago on Bosnian war criminals from the 1990s who are living here now. Um, and basically, if, if you were uh, applying for a visa from, from Bosnia in the mid-1990s, um, you were, it was an honor system. You basically said you know, you, that you were not where the Bosnian Serb terror force, um, and there was really no way of checking whether that was true or not. And so there were, um, as, as I reported the story, there were probably upwards of 300 Bosnian war criminals in the United States right now. Um, so if, if, if that problem existed 20 years ago, think what it was like 70 years ago. There must be some questions from younger people. I, I, I say, you know, I, 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 we got to open this up. Yes? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think there was certainly a, a lingering anti-Semitism that, that infused this af after the war. Uh, you know, Patton, I, I, I guess I can't leave without reading the one quote from Patton um, uh, about his view of Jews. Um, I, I mentioned the, the horrible conditions of the, the Jewish survivors, the Holocaust survivors, in those displaced person camps after the war when, when Patton ran the camps under Eisenhower um, he, he basically held the Jews in contempt, and there was a report from um, Earl Harrison to Truman. Um, this is in late 1945, saying, uh, it, it, talking about how the survivors weren't even given enough food to eat, there were no showers, they were made to wear the striped pajamas that the Nazis had put them in. And he said, uh, to, this is his report to Truman, as matters now stand, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them except that we do not exterminate them. And so I write in the book about General Patton's reaction to that. Uh, again, Pat, that's Patton on the right with Eisenhower. Um, so he was incensed about this report to Truman because this was, of course, an attack on his own operations in the camp. He was the top military commander running these camps uh, after we had just won the war. And uh, so what he wrote in his journal was this. Um, he said, I'm sorry, let me find it here writing about Earl Harrison, the man who wrote that report. He says, Harrison and his ilk believe that the displaced person is a human being, which he is not. And this applies particularly to the Jews, who are lower than animals, Patton wrote in his diary after learning of the scathing report to Truman. Laying bare the rabid anti-Semitism that infected the American refugee effort, Patton complained of how the Jews in one DP camp, with, quote, no sense of human relationships, unquote, would defecate on the floors and live in filth like lazy locusts. He told of taking General Eisenhower to tour a makeshift synagogue that the Jews in the camp had set up to celebrate the holy day of Yom Kippur. Quote, we entered the synagogue, which was packed with the greatest stinking mass of humanity I've ever seen, unquote. This was Eisenhower's first glimpse of the DPs, Patton wrote, so it was all new to him. Quote, of course, I have seen them since the beginning and marvel that beings alleged to be made in the form of God can look the way they do or act the way they act. Um, so if the Cold War was kind of the driving force between how, how the hell did all this happen, how did all these Nazis get here, and why didn't we do anything, anti-Semitism, I think, was, was number two or maybe number three. Um, because for a long time, you know, there, wasn't, there certainly wasn't the, the popular um, push for to do anything about this problem. And um, you were either oblivious to it or if you were vaguely aware that the the guy down the street was an SS officer, no one really cared. So I, I hope that answers your question. So. <laughs>
Yes, in the back, or here in the, in the back? Yeah. Um, I guess sort of to follow up on whether or not there was any, um, you know, Jew, American Jewish outrage with the Chuck Allen sort of early reports, did you hear of anything of like former GIs being incensed that this was happening? I mean, in, I remember when we first let Vietnamese refugees into the country and Vietnam vets were incensed yeah, that yeah. this was happening, and they, they certainly weren't high level people. Like this. Right, right. Um, I, I've heard a lot of stories like, like that since the book came out. Uh, you know, hearing from GIs about sort of how how um, upset they were to learn that all these people had gotten in. Um, but you know, if there was much of a realization at the Pentagon, it it didn't amount to anything. Um, you know, remember that the Pentagon had had taken sixteen hundred scientists into the country, um, and uh, you know had basically whitewashed their records. So. Um, it clearly was not an issue that, that Washington was going to do anything about. Yeah. So, yeah. How, how many was what was? Well, so, some of the uh, as far as the the Hungarian and Romanian, I, I'm counting those as kind of Nazi collaborators who who were part of this. Um, the Japanese, I, I didn't look at. There's actually probably another book for someone to write there. There's a whole bunch of declassified war crime files on Japanese war criminals in the United States um, sitting in the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. So I, I spent many months looking at the, the German side of that collection. There's a whole other side of that, probably millions of pages of records that probably answer that question. And, and I don't think much has really been done with that. Anyone else? Well, Eric, thank you so much. Thank you.